where to find, where to look for business opportunities. Of course, there is a number of questions that we have to tackle. Are there new business opportunities, first of all? If yes, where? Are technologies and new technologies helping us to find new opportunities? And what about the aging population? Is it just a problem? Is it creating only a problem, a challenge, or it can also create some opportunities? These are some of the few questions we will try to tackle and to address during uh, this hour. Of course, I won't do it alone. I'm in very good company with some uh, very good experts. So without any further ado, let me introduce them to you. I'm here today with uh, Olivier Collin, who is economic advisor and president du Mouvement Reformateur. Chris Moore, senior consultant at Capgemini uh, Consulting, and uh, Jose Guimaraes, Program Development Office of uh, Youth Proactive. So let's start with a warm-up question for all our experts, and you have to answer it just really one sentence. Which new branch of economy is more relevant in your view? Okay, um, so in my opinion, uh, I would say one of the, the most uh, relevant new branch of economy is the collaborative economy, as we, as we call sometimes the Uber economy. So, but it's, it's not only related to uh, transportation, it can be a, a wide range of activities we have uh, uh, Airbnb, we have a, a lot of activities in delivery, uh, in, uh, even we have 3D, 3D printers uh, uh, in collaborative economy. So I, I think this changed completely the way uh, we are thinking and it will lead to uh, structural changes in the way we are working and in the way we are creating value. And that's why I think really uh, like uh, companies like Uber is, is the future for, for us. I don't think it's a matter of having one economy that actually is uh, giving us the biggest opportunities. It's where different economies actually collide and different ideas come together that uh, you'll be able to grab the most of your investments. Good morning to you all. Uh, in my opinion, and this is also to a great extent influenced by, by, by my background in, in international re relations, I see things from a very uh, global uh, macro uh, perspective, although I also pay a lot of attention to the specifics. Uh, what I see as the, as the biggest uh, potential economy is the co economy that better manages to explore the potential of the European demographics in the present, both in the present and in the near future. Uh, moving just a bit forward, uh, the one sentence uh, that you said, I would just like to remind people of something which justifies uh, uh, my evaluation. By 2015, uh, this is World Bank uh, data, uh, the world population will change drastically. We'll have 9 billion people. Uh, most of the population will be not be in Europe. Europe will only, we have about six, seven billion people right now. The European po population will only increase 200, 300 mi million. It's just an, an estimation. The global GDP, 50% of it will be in Asia. So the aging population of Europe, which is something that uh, I'm sure we're gonna have the opportunity to keep talking uh, about it, is gonna be the great challenge. So every ec uh, economy that is related that tackles this issue and turns an issue into a problem, uh, into a solution, sorry, that uh, is where the economic potential lies. Yesterday, to those who were here, uh, we mentioned often that uh, we must uh, find a way so that the European youth ceases to be seen as a, pro uh, as a problem and starts being part of the solution. Well, the aging population, we need also to have the same framework. Thank you, you have highlighted very different, let's say, branches of new economy, and of course we cannot at this moment, analyze them in a very comprehensive way uh, in such a short time. But what we can do actually is to shed light on some of key features 
uh, that enable uh, businesses to, to, to start and to, to grow. And let's just take the example of technology and the way that technologies enable uh, new business to, to arise and to develop. Let's think about some example like the birth of the internet or the social networking websites and the way they help businesses reducing the cost of uh, business operations. So in which way can technology help small businesses reach new economic markets and or take the internationalization leap? I think it's um, an interesting question about technology. And when we, when we talk about small companies, one of the most important uh, aspects, uh, one of the most important problem is investment and money. And of course, technology is a good way to help those companies to access to financing. Uh, and we, we, we have seen the, the development of a lot of initiatives around that. And we can talk a lot about crowdfunding platforms and also the, those new um, innovative ways to finance uh, companies. And uh, I really think that's the most important aspect. Technologies can help to companies to find financing. And at the same time, I think for small companies, they have much better access to information than before. Uh, and, and it helps a lot uh, in the definition of the market, in the, the identification of uh, risks, uh, of opportunities, um, in uh, identific the identification of the needs of the customers uh, to be able to improve the targeting, to be able to improve uh, the, and customize the product and services. So that, that is also thanks to technology that, that we, we now small companies can uh, know much more um, about, about the market. And maybe the last uh, point is, of course, technology can decrease the, the cost of access to, to some markets um, by allowing small companies to, to have easy access to outsourcing um, activities in, in a wide range of uh, areas, such as, uh, I don't know, translation, um, web design, marketing, even human resource. You, you can uh, easily uh, outsource uh, not only to pe people, but with um, even mobile application, uh, um, plug-in, and so on. You, you can use those, those tools uh, to, to improve your business. Uh, I think those, those three, three ways uh, decrease the cost of access, uh, the access to information, and the access to financing. Chris, you work for a big corporation, and how do you see the way technology can play to help smaller business becoming big? Well, what, you, what you actually see is that smaller companies these days have a much higher growth rate than larger companies. Um, let's say 15 years ago, if you wanted to start a new firm, it took a lot of effort. What uh, all of you already said, if you wanted to have your finance done, you would have to go to banks, multiple finance runs. It took you a lot of time. That, what then happened is it took the time away from, for example, your mar marketing purposes. So one of the great things these days about crowdfunding is that you're not only getting your money in, but you're also simultaneously working on your marketing. Now. If you take that, so you take that growth rate that goes much, much faster, and you compare that these days to bigger companies and how they currently interact, what you're actually seeing is they have a lot of legacy. So if you ask yourself, why can't a bigger company move faster while it has this amount of resources, this amount of money, it's because they're also stuck in processes, systems that they've been building on over the last few years. Um, so that's their hindrance, and it's a hindrance that startups don't, don't have. If you then also combine it with the fact that due to technology, a lot of the work that you have to do to get something done, just building a website, until four years ago, if you wanted to build a website, you had to buy, or you had to hire a builder, or find it out yourself how you would do that. These days, you can build a website within just about 10 minutes. Go online, do it which all makes it easier and ramps up the pace. And that's what really, really can help young entrepreneurs to 
make a very rapid start. And what you then see is the faster you can move, the more agile you are, the faster you can grow. Um, and that's what's being said these days, that the boardrooms these days are actually scared of people, of actually four smart people and a garage, we always say, because that's where the competition comes from. Uh, I can only build up in what uh, you both said because I share entirely uh, both your views. I think, sp and I, I think the, when you think about the advantages of technology, when you think of a startup, they become more apparent, more evident uh, in a way because technology truly allows them to level up the, uh, their game. If you think of a company nowadays, let's face it, I only need a laptop and a smartphone to effectively run a company. If I need uh, to meet clients from different comp three clients in three different continents, I just need a Skype call. So the technology really helped uh, companies level up uh, their game. It ex became also extremely uh, democratic because resources also uh, technology wise, uh, advertising uh, um, wise, in my opinion, um, nowadays. Uh, Every company, one, should have a social media officer, and two, should be sure it pays them well, him or her, because uh, a good social media officer right now who can effectively use all these uh, t uh, the technology tools that we have nowadays with us, uh, it's gold. It's gold. It's gold because when the information of a company arrives to a, to a potential client, th it's not the size or the legacy of the company that's going to be the first thing that's going to struck is how well the company presents itself. It's how well the company sells itself. So in that sense, I think technology really helped a lot to bridge the gap between the bigger companies, already well established, and the startups. And I have a follow-up question uh, for you, Jose, and then of course for the other panelists based on that. Of course, Technology can help small businesses to grow and emerge in the market, find new market opportunities, and so on. But is there a way they can use the same technology to play at the same level as larger organizations? Or larger organizations will have any way a bigger advantage? Could, could you start with that, please? Yeah, yes, also because I think it's, uh, I can also build on what, uh, in th some things that I, uh, that I just said. Of course, uh, Let's not be naive. Of course, big companies still have access to tools, to equi equipment, to infrastructure. It's a very important thing, and I forgot uh, to mention pre previously. Uh, nowadays, for us to have a company, infrastructure became a secondary. I can have a company everywhere. I don't need to actually rent uh, an office. But of course, if I have a, a good office, if I can hire good technicians, if I can ha hire highly trained uh, personnel, well, that is always an advantage, of course. But in my opinion, the gap is being narrowed because truly, one, uh, as someone also mentioned yesterday, we are the most highly qualified generation ever in human history. And it's not so difficult to find a highly qualified person willing to, especially nowadays with the economic crisis, to participate in the startup. So in that sense, I, can, I don't need a lot, of, a lot of infrastructure. I can use all these new tools of technology. I can hire uh, personnel, which is also inter, with an entrepreneurial spirit, which is willing to help us uh, to, do, to do big things. And we can have big, uh, a big success in advertising. If we know how to do it, we don't need to be rich. And two, uh, if we are willing to learn and to learn to use the tools to narrow the gap. Chris, same question. How can a small business use the same technology to compete with a larger organization? Well, the key is not to use the same technology. The key is to use smarter technology. Um, and yes, then you can bridge, bridge the gap between them. So you have still have companies that are so big that they want to do business with big companies. Elephants work with elephants, so to say. But on the other hand, what we found, uh, and just take an example of ourselves, uh, we were under tremendous pressure from what we call the freelancers. And we actually tried to figure out, so what's happening? Why are these big companies currently working with all these small persons? And then what we've actually found out is that while going in there, you would see connectors, you would see people having huge networks that were able to mobilize a team of freelancers who were ac actually capable of doing these same things we can. 
Um, so in such a way, we have a direct competitor, but we can't find the actual competitor in there. And you see that happening in a lot of businesses. So what the technology currently does, it takes away a lot of the infrastructure needs that you have. And then it becomes much more a question, are you credible to the uh, company that you want to do business with? Um, and can you convince them that you can do the same job as that a company of 1,000, 10,000, 40,000 people can do? Olivia. Maybe if, if I just can add one thing. Um, when, when you are talking about competition and if small companies cannot compete with large companies thanks to technology, I think uh, we really have to differentiate uh, all the part of the, the value chain and even all the, the, the aspect of a company. So, of course, in the internal functioning, I would say, of the company, uh, for me, there is no gap anymore. Because even in terms, uh, as, as my, my colleague said, in terms of infra infrastructure, you can, you can know, I mean, you, you don't need the big servers anymore. You can put everything uh, on the cloud. Um, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of tools um, to, to help uh, small companies to, to be managed like big companies. Even if you look at data, data analysis, uh, on, uh, about customers, there are a lot of tools that they don't need, like a, a big department of marketers to to analyze all the data. The tools exist, but there are some some aspects. I mean, for for instance, wh what comes to my mind is branding. Uh, in terms of branding, for for instance, I don't see exactly um, how technology can. I mean, it it can help, of course, but. I, I still see a, a gap between large and, and small companies, and I, I'm not sure that uh, technology can help to completely f uh, make the, the, the gap disappear in terms of, so there are several aspects, and of course, large companies will still have some, some advantages. Actually, to redirect on that one, if you take, for example, branding, because it's a very good example, if you see how traditionally companies would spend their money, I mean, there, there will be huge amounts of money being poured in commercials, in, uh, in their branding. And what you see these days is it's being democratized. So I can have a campaign, try to bring a brand out there, and as long as I'm consistent and really thought about what I want to bring out there, the actual tools to bring that to people are much, much cheaper than they were 5, 10, 15 years ago. And with that in mind, what you actually see is, again, that small companies now can compete with uh, bigger ones because you don't have to buy f millions and millions of euros on commercials on TV anymore. You can do it much faster, much smarter, but you do, do have to apply the technology in a different way than larger companies would do that. You've, you've touched a very interesting question about advertisement because once you have created the product, of course, you have to put it out there and to let people know that it exists. So concerning advertisement, it, it has been very important in the past and of course it's essential even today, but it has been changing over time. So are there new technologies that are changing the nature of advertising in any way, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, uh, in the digital age, uh, as it's so often referred to the time we're living, and it's just getting started, um, I see two major changes in, in uh, advertisement. The essence hasn't changed, of course. It's still about shaping consumer behavior towards a specific product. Uh, but the form has changed. It has changed. Nowadays, uh, there was a time it was just TV and radio, Nowadays, with all these communication channels uh, that we have at our disposal for very affordable prices, m most of them, uh, everything is, information is overcrowded. We hear this very often, but uh, not too often we do the linkage to ad advertising. This means that every company needs to compete, so to speak, every second, every time someone is using the smartphone or checking uh, the, the laptop, every time opens a, a website, the amount of information we are bombarded with uh, is sometimes um, overwhelming. 
so what's happening right now, so the form has changed because now we have a, a company w which wants to invest strong in advertisement, can use uh, multiple simultaneous channels. We're talking about applications, of course we're talking about uh, websites, we're talking about emails, everything can be, uh, we can invest everything at the, at the same time. Now we even have this new uh, tendency which they call advert gaming, which is when we are opening a game and all of a sudden pops in uh, some uh, some advertisement from a company. It's Sometimes it's insane, but it's true. And um, and the other thing that, that I believe is changed uh, is the public's expectations. It's all very pretty to say, yes, we are, it's a new techno technology, uh, technological age, but if the public is bombarded with so much information, it also means that his expectations are a lot higher, even if he doesn't uh, realize it. Uh, almost paradoxically, at the same time, uh, we are feeling the sense of intrusion that everything, Facebook, everything, is they all want our data, all information. So they, uh, they even refer to it as online etiquette. Uh, so, but it's true. On one hand, we have consumers who, which, on the modern age with internet, if they want to know something about company A, they want to be able to know everything about company A in 10 seconds with just a click. But at the same time, they don't want company A to send all uh, a portfolio of products or everything. So it's a very complicated um, game. And the other thing that it's also becoming quite apparent, it's been referred to today, is that uh, advertising is becoming a two-way street. Those who watch the television series Mad Men, uh, how things started in the 1950s, when people were staring at the TV, when it was a TV boom, well, those days are gone. It's not people sitting on the couch and uh, uh, being told what to do, what to buy. Nowadays, if you create a product, you need to communicate with, uh, with your potential audience, have the feedback, and then uh, continue this feedback. It's, it's a process that never stops. I would say I, I share most of your, your ideas and I think really the, the, the balance between uh, the expectation and the, the immersive aspect of advertising is, is, is really an issue. Um, but I think the, the, the general aspect behind that is time. It leads to, in my opinion, much more customization of uh, the advertisement. We cannot really adapt or the the message to the people individually, you know. Uh, if the if somebody is is uh, shopping in the supermarket, we can uh, tell him uh, on his mobile phone, okay, you bought that product last week. Why not to buy it again? You will get five percent discount or something. Yeah, it's really live communication and a specific uh, message addressed to specific people. Um, but of course, there is the, the, the balance to find with uh, the immersive aspect because uh, we have technology opens to a much more creative uh, initiative in advertising, but at the same time, it can become really immersive and, pe and people can feel like uh, aggressed by, by, by the, the advertisement. So, uh, and and you, you talked about the two-way two street and that's also an uh, interesting uh, aspect. Uh, now with advertising, we can really include the, the customer in the creation process of the, the product or service. And um, I, I always like the, the example of, uh, of Lace with the, the crisps when, when they did like a contest uh, to, to ask people to, to propose a new test for the, the crisp and it was like 250,000 people participated to the, the contest which is like huge. And finally they had at the end of the contest a new test uh, on the markets. And it becomes interesting because uh, you, you can really be innovative if you put people on the table to share and discuss ideas. But if those people are also your potential customers, then you can win on both sides. So that's why it's the two, two side aspect is really interesting. Before giving you uh, the, um, the phone, uh, Chris, I have like three comments to, to, to make on what uh, the other two speakers said. And the first is that now the way the technology is changing, the, the way we do advertising, uh, has also created new business models. 
if you think about uh, mobile applications that are for free, are for free because most of them are based on um, advertising. They are full of social media like Facebook, like Twitter, like LinkedIn, and Google as well, who basically get their money from advertising. So uh, let's say the technology uh, created also new kind of business models. Uh, we talk about like targeted advertising, of course, through the internet, the use of cookies. Every time you go now on a website, you have to accept these cookies that basically understand who you are, what you want, and they tell you what you want before you even know, actually. Is this possible that we'll have this kind of targeted advertising also on TV, with the smart TV and the connection to the internet? Last question, boomerang effect. We are now overwhelmed by advertising as much as we are overwhelmed by information. Is there a chance that uh, we can have a boomerang effect so that all these advertising we are having, we are not gonna watch it anymore just because we are sick of it? Think about uh, email marketing. We receive, I don't know how many, 20, 30 emails per day and that 90% are advertising and it's very difficult for the person who does advertising to even hope that the person will open the, the email. So you have you know the funnel uh, of the thousand of people that you send the email. There are I don't know ten percent who open the email, and maybe one percent will actually arrive to your website, and then nobody knows how many are gonna uh, buy or purchase your product. So, uh, Chris, how do you see you know this evolution in advertising, the use of technology, but also the side effects of it? So, to answer your first uh, question, because it's the easiest one, do we see this happening on TV already? Um, I don't know whom of you have Netflix over a certain type of service. There it's happening already. You've looked at these uh, series, probably this is a good idea for you. It's basically advertising on t TV, so it's already there. So if you look at the new bus business models, models yeah, you see a lot of new business models. They're marketing driven, they are uh, much more specific. You see s n not only subscription um, apps coming up, but you also see the advertising and the uh, mixes between them. And those are the most interesting ones these days. You see it quite often, you get a free app that you can work on, that you can play with, and then if you like it, you can actually buy it. And why do you buy it? Because you want to get rid of the apps or the advertisements, um, which is a very interesting business model, which we only really saw coming up within the last one and a half years. Before that, it was either a free, free uh, app or you had to pay from it upfront. So you see these kinds of developments coming up uh, very much. Now, the thing that we did not discuss uh, on advertising yet is, uh, and that's where the game really changed, is the way that we use technology to engage the public and not the public in a one-way street back, but or two-way street back, but the many-to-many -many, uh, conversations that you have. Just to have a um, example of that, if you look at uh, KLM, KLM does a lot of their online or a lot of their complaint services. They do online. They do it on Facebook and such. And but what they then generate is that when they have solved the problem quick and effectively, you get a huge amount of um, additional people seeing that you solved that problem. So you're Actually, what happens is that a lot of your marketing budget that you first spent on the adverti advertisements is now being generated by other people. It's you as a flyer having a problem or having a question, going to them, asking them, them that question. At that point in time, you're actually generating advertisement value for them because you put it on there in the 200 Facebook friends that you have see the name KLM popping up. And you see that coming on more and more and more. Uh, another very good example of that, actually who does it very smart, is uh, Starbucks. Now, most of you probably have been to Starbucks before, and you have to give your name there. Nine out of 10 times your name is being misspelled. That's not an accident. Somebody actually thought about that and thought, well, if you misspell the name, what's going to happen? Well, people are going to think this is funny they will put it on Facebook or they put it on the other social networks that they're on and they're generating advertisement value for you. So that's what's happening. That's why the game is really starting to get very interesting. And there's also the point in your third, are we get getting fed up with commercials? Yeah, we're getting fed up with commercials, but we're not getting fed up with 
the updates of our friends. If you look at Facebook, the amount of time that people spend on Facebook is ever, ever increasing. So what are they looking at? They're looking at what their friends are doing. What are their friends blogging about? Well, their friends are blogging or tweeting or whatever, you know, about fun things they see. For example, their name mi being misspelled on, on uh, Starbucks. So that's how the game really starts to get together and it's all technology enabled. Uh, the only thing I can add is that, uh, as you see, it's already happening, uh, this change in, in, in advertising. I do think, um, I mean, it's all about, as I said, um, the, the information market, so to, so to speak, with which we've uh, constantly floated, it's already more than uh, overcrowded. So uh, the future of advertising, uh, in a way, in a way, will be to do what we would uh, call a sort of a, also an indirect uh, advertising. So maybe, uh, for example, I will, I'm the CEO of Starbucks. Maybe I'm not able to make people watch uh, Starbucks ads uh, several times a day, every day. But if uh, I have customers go in there and I can somehow ensure that that person went there, announces it, and then posts a, a photo in having a, a an American coffee inside of it, that's advertising. And this applies for everything. So I think in the future, what's going to be is that the gap between the product and the client, uh, it, there will come a time where uh, we posting things about ourselves will become in the sociable of posting things about specific companies, specific products. And that's where many companies uh, we're going to be do doing it. And there's ways of doing it. And it's uh, al already happening. Because there you go, as you said, and quite wisely, we never get tired of watching our friends feed, feed news. So every time um, Christophe uh, was having a coffee there, Giselle had shopping there, that's advertising. That's, and that's cold and it's free. So one of the things that you currently also see happening, that's why this is actually very important, is uh, you get something that we call the information bubble. So we're with four people. If we go to Google now and we ask the same question to Google, we're getting different types of information. Uh, we get different sites. We get a different way of that it being served to us. And if you take that concept and you take it a little bit further, what actually happens is that we're starting to sift away a lot of the information that we don't want. We do it via filters. Google does it for us. So we're already getting information in that we think or Google believes is most relevant for us. So if I never drink coffee, to take the example, what will happen, and it's probably with one and a half years, I will never see anything from Starbucks. I will not see one advertisement of Starbucks. So the only way for Starbucks or any other company to then reach me is to actually find a way to penetrate my bubble. And the way to get there as it stands now, is probably the social effect. Somehow, virality is the key, reaching you through the connection that you have. That's very, very interesting. Spill and over. Let's a spill over. So okay, yeah, so sorry, sorry, sorry. So let's jump down to a new. Uh, we have a question from the. Yeah, please. Is it? Okay, perfect. Um, I just uh, I'm listening to this very interesting, uh, very interesting discussion about reaching the clients, and I must say that uh, I have learned quite a lot about about it today. Uh, so thank you very much for your contributions. I um, I, I just have a feeling that um, I agree with all of you uh, with your statement that we are kind of bombarded by d different kinds of information, and 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 right now we we actually spend three seconds on information we receive. Uh, because simply we have so much of it that we cannot really focus much more on that. Um, but I also believe that uh, that uh, the future of, of 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 marketing and the future of of, um, of of selling of trade is simply to 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 kind of build a community of your clients. Uh, and it's already happening, but uh, because because of course many many um, uh, many many big corporations already are building such communities uh, either online technology gives us this, this these tools to do that because uh, for instance if if we are bombarded by different information on tv that is is actually not really interactive so we are just receiving this information we don't comment on it 
um, then we are kind of getting sick of TV because uh, at a certain point, I mean, how many how many soap operas I can watch and how many adverts I can see. Uh, however, if you if you have a certain business, as, as you as you just mentioned, we have a, a number of people who enjoy coffee. Then, of course, um, uh, kind of corporations will be looking to to kind of build a, a community of people that are simply enjoying this coffee or, or their their product. Um, and I think that's the future, really. Uh, I don't know what you what you think about it. So I don't have a question; it's just a comment. Maybe can I just add one thing. Um, I I fully agree with um, the, the community aspect, and I think it's completely linked to to the the idea of co-creation and the idea of uh, customer as a creator of marketing value. And maybe if if we can summarize the whole idea is that that company companies now must understand that uh, the customers are the best employees because they are part of the creation and they are the best marketers because they create that themselves marketing value through community and through social networks and so on. So customer is the best employee and the best marketer for companies. And definitely all these, um, let's say revolution in the digital world and in the way we do advertising is also changing somehow the way we perceive the information. And this leads basically to also a new kind of education for us receiving uh, the information. You said that we spend now three seconds per uh, uh, per information. That's quite a lot, even for for somebody. Just you know, just skip it. The information, but also is creating maybe on the other hand a new branch of market of those who knows how to communicate in an effective way. So there are some uh, advertising, uh, especially would say you are never going to succeed in a campaign if you don't have a video or you just put in you know, a few texts and more images in your in your email maybe you have more chance to have your um, your campaign view and, and and click on it and there are also some others who tell you you know there is a specific number of words you should put in the subject of your email to be more successful and so the next question i would like to ask yesterday we talked about a reform into uh, the the education an education that should take into account the digital revolution. Is this new education, a sort of education 2.0, could open the doors to new business opportunities or find new economies, new branches of economy that we could explore? Is there a way that we could promote a new kind of education that could boost uh, the economy and also help small businesses? Uh, just so, see if I understand the question. So, if whether or not this uh, digital revolution, this and the education, uh, if it um, if it also brings about uh, a change of paradigms in uh, in education, just so. Uh, yeah, let's say uh, we had so far a kind of education in school and universities, which is very let's say orthodox and somehow uh, kind of not updated with uh, today's market needs. So is the new education in many different fields, not only, of course, the study businesses and, uh, and, and technology, but also in all different kind of uh, education, if we should include more uh, digital studies and digital understanding, and if this, let's say, promoting this new kind of education could help people be even more proactive, since this is the topic of the summit. I think uh, it's indispensable for something li like this to happen. You already see... Uh, in many schools, um, when the the tablets uh, first started appearing, several schools, uh, or at least several uh, universities, started getting some. Uh, I remember I have an example in my uh, in my country, Portugal. I remember there was a university uh, faculty of journalism, and there was a class. They bought tablets for everyone because they said that this is going to be your future. This was already uh, some years ago. But regarding uh, so, when talking about education, this really has to be bottom up. We're talking about students in primary school, uh, at least, so from a very tender age, they need to be digitally lectured, uh, so to speak, because that is going to be the core uh, of their teach, uh, the tools which are going to be used for their education, and then their professional life, everything is going to be connected with digital. So digital um, uh, literacy, I think it's even a, a better name, is going to become a core. Uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a key uh, driver in uh, in modern societies. Uh, it's already it's already starting, as I said, but 
it's only starting the digital revolution. That is also my perception. Uh, I do think it's going to become more and more and more integrated. There's some country, that, of course, uh, answering your question, there's another detail here. Some countries are more, you even refer the word orthodox. Well, some countries are more orthodox in their approaches to education than others. Not every country is Finland, for example, and if, for those who know what I mean. And to be open for that, that also means the role of the professor has to change to make room for the digital. Digital is not a rival of the professor who's going to steal time for his lectures or something. No, everything needs to be integrated. How much time that's going to take? Well, that's another issue. Right. Um, about, about education, I, I think it opens to a lot of business uh, opportunities and it's on both sides, you know, education will depend on the, the evolution of, uh, of the technology, digital technology and on the ideas coming on the, on the market and, and on the other side, uh, the evolution of education opens the door to, to, um, to new creative uh, ideas I, I heard a few weeks ago about a mobile application to to improve the in interaction between the, the professor and the students when you are talking in front of uh, 200 students. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to have interaction, so with a mobile application you can ask some questions uh, and have specific answer. You can do statistics about all, all the, the, the answers, or you can even proceed to a vote easily. So that kind, that kind of things that, come to, that comes to the market. But um, I think the, the, the main question behind everything is uh, to find the right business model. Because of course you have to monetize uh, those ideas. And in education it's, uh, it's even more difficult to, to monetize than in other uh, Markets, so the business model is really important. And um, one one last thing uh, in, in in the development of, of business ideas uh, around education, I think uh, serious game and educational games uh, are also uh, the future of uh, of our education. Uh, I think the market will grow a lot. I, I heard about uh, a market uh, of 2.5 billion uh, till 2017. So it's it's really a, it's really an important market, and there are a lot of uh, stu studies showing that that kind of game, you know, are really useful for for children to to you know to be involved in the in the, the education process and the learning process. Yeah, tot totally agree on that, that one. Um, I think the saying is if you uh, tell someone something, you have a chance of about 2% that it stays on. If you show it to them, it's got about 25%. If you actually let them do it, what you then see is that it sticks. Um, but basically, this question is around, I think, three things. So wh what are we currently, uh, what are we teaching? Does that have to change? How uh, are we cheating that? And what are the business opportunities that come from that? So if you look at the what, yes, we need more, di we need more digital, but we need the skills, not so much the content. So when I was, and I'm probably the oldest one in the room currently, when I was at the university, they th thought it was a very good idea to help us get ready for the internet age. So we were uh, asked, or we asked, we were obliged to study Delphi as a, programming language. Now, looking at this room, who knows Delphi? I've heard about it. Heard about it. Good. More than expected. Huh? More than expected. But who uses Delphi these days? No, one. no, nobody. So the thing is, we have to get into skills. We have to have people that are capable of uh, working around with ra very rapidly changing environments. And these days, that ca can be uh, digital. It can be something totally different in 15 years' time. And that's when this generation has to be ready. So that's about, it's much more about skills than about knowledge. And indeed, talk, uh, looking uh, to your point, if you see some countries, they're much further. If you look at the Netherlands, if you look, for example, the US, they're much more skill-based teachings than if you look, for example, France or Spain, which is much more into knowledge-based which both have, have its uh, own merits, 
but for the future, it has to change. Now, in the how it changed, that goes very, very rapidly at this point in time. So if you look, for example, uh, MIT, Harvard, they're uh, offering huge, uh, huge online classes. So the spillover effect to other universities then becomes very apparent, because why would I follow a college with a good willing but mediocre professor on a specific topic if I can uh, teach or learn from the best from the best from a professor teaching that at Harvard and I can do that. Can aging population be an important driver for uh, economic growth? Um, uh, I really like to, to, to talk about senior people because it's like the, um, the, the market where you, you can have the most uh, innovative business ideas, and and I think there are a lot. Um, there you can even find dating websites for for senior people now. So, um, but my my the point that I would like to raise is that we all the time when when we talk about senior people, we only look at one side of the equation. We think okay. People, those people are all, they have time, they have uh, money at their disposal because they don't spend a lot of money. Uh, they need help, so let's try to find some ways to help them and you know take them, their money and, and launch a business around that. But there is another side of the equation, is that those people have something to bring, and most of the time they want to bring something. And this is really important because Okay, no, when we think about all people, we, we, we think that they have money. Maybe it's the case in Belgium. I'm not sure it's the case everywhere in, in Europe. And I'm not sure it will still be the case uh, in, within 10, 10, 15 years. We, we, we talk, they talked in the video about pension. Uh, I'm working for the government, I know <laughs> how it is. So we, we don't know how it is going to evolve. So I think we sh should really try uh, and it's a challenge for entrepreneurs, it's a challenge for governments uh, to find ways to put those people back to work uh, in some ways. Um, we can think about uh, all those companies employing uh, students uh, because uh, they need like part-time specific employment. Um, we can do the same with old people, you know, students are cheap and they are available uh, like two hours a day or one day a week, and that's why we are the companies are using them. But we can do the same with uh, retired retired people, and I think it's only by looking at both sides of the equation that it will lead to economic growth because we can offer as much ideas as we want. If there is no purchasing power on the other side, they will no they will not uh, accept it. It, to build on that, just to give an example of a company that uh, actually works with the elder people and having them time, is a, uh, I think it's a, a small Dutch firm that actually helps uh, people uh, or students learn English or Dutch by connecting them to people that are in a retirement home because to help them to connect. So that solves on the one hand the problem with the aging people of being uh, alone and seeing all, and seeing all your friends go away, but still having that interaction and the benefit for the students actually is to then learn the language. The big benefit uh, for the company behind it was just plain out money compared to the social. The other thing is that we always look at the aging population as being uh, an issue. If you look at the current developments going on in robotization, think about self-driving cars. So what's going to happen in 10 years' time when every car can drive itself? Well, it's nice for you and me, we don't have to drive ourselves. Think about what will happen to the cab branch, to the transporting. What if every truck in Europe is being driven by a laptop? That's going to cost thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs, and those will have to replace large population of the, uh, or the aging of a large part of a population actually can help bringing the uh, part of a population back to work in jobs that will help that part. Now, whether or not uh, can aging populations become uh, engines of economic growth, I think in Europe we don't have any chance. Um, I will just add a small information to what I, uh, what I said in the beginning about what the future holds for us in 2050. Uh, for a long time, 20% of the wealth, uh, the richness um, 
of the world was was concentrated in like 20 percent of the of the world of the world's population so-called developed countries while the, the rest was in the remaining 80 percent now this 2080 rule is ceasing to um, to apply because by 2050 not only we're we gonna lose a lot of population uh, when comparing to asia for example we're going to become only a small portion of the population, unfortunately. Uh, but two thirds of the um, of the middle, middle class, two thirds are going to be in Asia. This means that our social uh, protection, our social net, that right now, uh, also because of the crisis, is a bit under stress. It's going to become the situation is not going to, going to get better. So uh, this means that all of us here in this room whether we want it or not, by the time we reach the age of 40, we're going to have to be able to look ourselves in the mirror and say, I'm a young man or a young woman, because otherwise uh, we're a bit screwed. We're going to work a lot longer than our grandparents did, and some, some of us, even, even our parents. Bringing all, uh, aging people back to work, uh, definitely, and I think this, this has to be a two-pronged strategy. One, so I'm talking about this, uh, a European major requalification industry. First, an industry capable of people who already stop working because they reach a certain age, but they still feel themselves physically and mentally capable and they want to work, they want to help, help them reintegrate the, work mar the labor market. And second, and this is something that has started now, it concerns all of us. We have to create an education system which allows people not to become a lawyer, become a doctor. That is all very pretty, it's not going to go away. But we have to be able, and that is the single uh, greatest asset of the, um, of the future em empl uh, employee. Be able to have different jobs, truly have different jobs and be trained and qualified for that along uh, uh, its lifetime. Because we're going to live for a long time the mobility is going to be a lot bigger than it was in the past. Forget long life contracts. That uh, here in Europe, at least, that's going to d disappear more and more. We have to be able to do that, and we have to be able at least like well, almost like at least seventy, at least because that's how things are. Of course, uh, so there's this uh, economy which needs to be explored, a requalification for the ones who are still young and for the ones who uh, who are already aged. And of course, it was already referred. The silver economy also brings a lot of opportunities in robotics and many, many other technological fields. And uh, related to that, there is also another, let's say, side of the coin that this technology are also shaping uh, some of our cities with new technologies, with new infrastructures. Uh, we have now the concept of uh, smart cities, so the um, um, the use of new technology, connected uh, technology, to see what, what, where we were going and, and when we'll uh, reach this destination, but it's also creating a new concept called age-friendly city. Let's see this video, what is uh, an age-friendly city, and then I will ask you a question about uh, this new concept. I think it's very important to have outdoor space, a place to take grandchildren. I want the bus stop more in front of the city center. Definitely need affordable transportation. I need affordable and quality senior housing. I would like to see our elected officials more visible in our community. I don't want to have to navigate this mysterious healthcare system on my own. I expect better communication from my health services. I need a doctor who would be in my language. It's never too late to change for the better. It will be a continuous battle to make sure that life is good for seniors. And I'm hopeful that we'll get there soon. <laughs> when we say age-friendly city or hospital or health center, the emphasis is on age. We're not saying senior friendly. We are looking at a setting, it could be the city, from the lens of an older person. And if it's going to be friendly to this older person, it's going to be friendly to everyone. So, are there any opportunities in the age-friendly cities? Well, 
I, I think it's all about um, the expectations of those people. And um, of course, they, they have different expectations and they want to feel comfortable. And that's why uh, it's it, that's why I, I like the, this, this segment of market because you can you can apply almost everything in a different way for them because they need it uh, just for them. You know, a good example is um, uh, in the United States um, two three years ago, uh, a company launched a sports center for old people. But when, when we think about sports center, we just imagine people you know, doing physical exercise. But there is just old people, uh, I, I mean senior people in front of a computer uh, doing cerebral sports to, to train the brain. You know, So I think there are a lot of uh, opportunities, um, like sector per sector, to, to, to really uh, launch initiative and bring, bring business to the, those people, of course. Just if you just take the concept of the city as a uh, collection of building and pe people, only already in that one, what we used to do with uh, el elder uh, people is that we would shove them off to the borders of the city or we would take them to a small village or whatever, somewhere beautiful outside. And what you're actually seeing currently is not the population not only getting older, but their wishes are changing. They have are, are accustomed in working and living in dynamic uh, environments and they don't want to go somewhere else. So the first impact that you actually see is that you start to see much more uh, residences for the elderly, not at the edges, but at actually at city centers, which makes much more sense because then public transport is better, they can uh, move around a lot more and still um, working on that one. Does that create opportunities? Yes, if you have a building company, it does. If you have uh, a company that works with people and uh, it does because you now can get your labor force actually from the city which enables you to have a much larger uh, much larger pool so yes there are a lot of opportunities just by housing more and more elderly into the cities and getting the city more friendly f for them um, the question is how do small entrepreneurs actually are able to grab that because building a, uh, a re retirement home actually takes a lot of money. So it will be a, r a lot around the support functions that the actual gaps are. So the digital assistant, or re the example that I already said, connecting youth with elderly, uh, doing more and more chores, those types of things actually can help. Um, and I think one of uh, big example what happened in uh, Rotterdam and Amsterdam was you normally have uh, different housing, for example, for students, for pe uh, p uh, young people just working and for elderly. What they did is they combined those houses and said, well, actually, on this floor, there will be five uh, retired people who have two students and who have some young, young uh, working people, which actually then brings together a social event to connect those people, the young helping the el elderly, but also because the young are working longer, being supported by the elderly in things of just taking care of packages that are being delivered and such on, or taking care of kids. So there are a lot of opportunities in there. It's just a way how, for a young entrepreneur how to grasp them. I would like to just add um, one, uh, one, one small note. Uh, I think th uh, the age-friendly city concept is very promising. To be fully implemented needs several pillars. Uh, one of them, I think, it's actually uh, what we would call, um, which in some uh, countries is stronger, uh, community culture. Many of us, especially those who've been in Brussels for long enough, we've all heard about internships, unpaid internships, and so many things. Now, I'm wondering, I'm wondering just, how many people who complain, because they are a lot, who complain month after month, that sometimes they cannot even get an unpaid internship here. How many of them, for example, uh, who work in uh, social related psychologists or other areas, even t even technolo technological, ever considered approaching an elderly person and offering to provide him, him or her a service? You're doing a job. It goes to your, to, your, to your CV. But how many of us ever think of it? And from a corporate perspective, 
how can a startup uh, kind of find a niche? A startup, like many small companies, has an advantage. It's extremely agile, extremely flexible. The startup can help bigger companies get into the silver economy, a friendly cities con concept, by approaching with great ease elderly people. Because, I don't know if you notice, if you give an elderly person, especially those, maybe they don't have much family or something like that, you give them a bit of your attention. Even if you ask, uh, dear sir, dear ma'am, would you like to help us? Uh, we're doing a, a survey, a research about this. They will love you. They will love you. And you're working. Now, how many of us ever thought about using our free time to use elderly people? So, Jose, commenting on that, do you see a future in the so-called social business? The possibility of creating business that are not only, let's say, profit-driven, but also they want to create a value for the collective good instead of uh, an individual profit. Do you see a future in that? Is it possible to run a business which is social on the one hand, but it also can be competitive and profitable on the other hand? Um, maybe also because of my background, I see things in a very realistic way. And I know that uh, worlds, uh, there's too many shades of gray. It's not this, white and black. There's not, in my opinion, social business and profit-driven business. Why? Because in my opinion, the most effective uh, social businesses are the ones who, have, who are run, running effectively. It's not about uh, making profit, is it? It's what do we do with this profit? If I run a social business and I make a lot, a lot, a lot of money, but I reinvest a lot of this money in more social services while still being able to pay competitive salaries to my workers, then I'm a hell of a social entrepreneur. It's all about what we do. Every company, when it's foundation, like, what do we do? What is our purpose? What is the service our company uh, does to society in general? And stick it in a... In a, in a board or something, so that every worker in the morning when he comes to work sees it. It's not about profit-driven. If I want to be a good social entrepreneur and help the world, I'm going to be, then I'm going to use this motivation, this youth, to draft a very good business plan, a sustainable business plan, a competitive business plan. So I'll ju just say that the tools are not at odds. That's my opinion. Chris, what do you think about social business? Well, it depends a little bit on the uh, description you use on it. So if you look from it from a point of view, a, a business trying to get earn its money and trying to have a social aspect in there, um, what you actually then see with a lot of those businesses is actually they're serving two goals. And uh, that could be something that's very good. So if I take an analogy and take it a little bit uh, higher, um, it's about a sense of purpose about uh, doing a job that's more than just a job. Because mostly with social business, what you see, it's about the people actually conducting that. Um, and to take an example, if I take Harley Davidson, which is not per se a social company, but what, is, what it is, it's a company in which everyone that works there has a very good common sense, is that they want to build the best bikes ever. As a consequence, everyone working there wants to continue working there, wants to build the best thing they have. And that's something you can't reach by just tr pouring more and more money on that one. So if you take the other side and then look at banks, for example, if you look, so what happens if you just have a very good business model uh, which w generates a lot of money and you can earn that and such on? Does it create loyalty? Does it uh, bring about a connection to the people? Does it bring something to the environment uh, and to the social connections? It doesn't. And we've seen that the last few years. So for young entrepreneurs to really have a good understanding on what they're currently doing and what they want to achieve, not only in a financial point of view, but also on a higher goal, is not only to have a higher chance to succeed, but also to have a higher chance of succeeding with the right people, because they will be attracted to work for you.
I, I can only agree. I mean, uh, especially with the, the, the with uh, Jose, um, I think the the successful social entrepreneur uh, will be the one uh, who underst understand that uh, he needs to he or her needs to he or she sorry needs to operate in a way uh, that the, the the first goal should be money. You know, so f most most of the mistakes of social un entrepreneur is that they 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 try they try to put the social aim at the f on the first side, but it's only with money that you can achieve your your social goal. So so I, I fully agree with you. You ha you have to to be competitive to to build a strong business plan, and then that that money will help to help you to achieve your your social aim. Thank you. There are uh, lots of many other questions that I would like to ask you, but uh, I'm afraid we are running uh, out of time. Uh, I want to ask you a very last question before concluding and maybe open uh, to the floor. If um, Are there any questions from the audience? One? Okay. So my last question for you is based on your experience, what's the piece of advice would you like sharing with the young entrepreneurs uh, here with us today? Really, based on your experience, what would you tell to the people who are in the audience who wants to run a business? What would you tell them? Um, I, I, I would say, um, I, I will just tell you a short, very short story uh, that I, I always think about when, you know, when, when talking about entrepreneurship. Um, it's about um, uh, an athlete, Ro Roger Bannister, so for like thousands of years, people thought that it was like completely impossible to run uh, one mile in less than four minutes. Like the, the, the ancient Greek, they were using lions to chase uh, the athletes in order to achieve that, that goal, but it was like impossible. And in, I think, 1954, something like that, that guy, Roger Bannister, he did it. He did the one mile in less than four minutes, and it was such an extraordinary event that they even uh, made, like in the parliament in UK, they made like a break, <laughs> you know, because it was extraordinary. And what is interesting is that the same year, 37 other people did the same after him, you know. So I would say, I mean, the the, the basic sentence behind this is nothing is nothing is impossible, and. I, I think I think it's true. We, we always need those inspirational uh, people to show us, us uh, the way of doing, of changing the rules. And uh, also one, one last thing: uh, don't be afraid of failure, because uh, I mean, in European societies, uh, we, every every people is afraid of failure. And uh, I think it's only by by f with failure that that you can achieve something. So fail, fail again, and fail better. If you want to be a, a startup company, you want to do something yourself, go freelance. If you want to build a company, make sure you have a team. They don't necessarily have to be part of your company, but they can be your friends, family, investors, coaches, whatever. The bigger ecosystem you build around you, if you have the right people in there that can help you, that can help you shape your thinking, then you bring yourself, then you set yourself up for success. I can also only build on that. Uh, my only advice would be first learn. And if for whatever reason you believe that your capability of learning, because you're hard at it or whatever, not so good, then teach yourself to learn. And surround yourself with people who are ca also capable of learning and want always to learn more. Because only by learning they can improve. Surround yourself by like-minded people, humble people who want to learn, hard-working people who love what you're doing just as much as you do. Because they will feel it and you will feel that they, al they also do it. And every day, that's what's going to make you uh, get out of bed. That is the truth. Otherwise, you'll not do it. And you have to be able to do it over a sustained period of time. Don't be afraid of failure at first because you, that's also part of learning. Learn from the mistakes. Don't be frustrated. Use that energy to learn from the mistakes and go harder. And transmit that energy to, uh, to your team. 
because they will also feel it and they will always also feed you and they will help you also uh, get up in the morning and you l and you have and this I think it's it's one of the biggest cliches but you can only do all this if you really love what you do so find what is that one thing that makes you get a, get up in the morning without even questioning whether or not you should get up and then you just do it follow that path and be consistent with it that's all i can say thank you Hazan. let's open now to the floor to the audience so we have a question uh, right on the back Okay. Hello, my name is Katia Muñoz. Um, I'm currently working as a marketing and sales consultant for startups. Recently, I had the opportunity to be the project manager of an uh, uh, entrepreneur in Luxembourg, developing a solution on robotics related to aging population. And what I liked a lot was the cooperation um, with uh, research centers in Luxembourg. They were very happy to work with him to have the, you know, the possibility to uh, compile all the data that they were working on research to make an open innovation. Um, I think that in that context, it was like an interesting example because Luxembourg is a very small country and the network, everyone knows each other down there. Um, but I, I was curious about your um, experience in other contexts, what 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 do you think? How how is the interaction, or the concept of open innovation and um, yeah networking, let's say, between research centers and uh, people uh, in in startups, startuppers and entrepreneurs. Thank you. Who wants to start? Uh, in my opinion, I can I can I can start. Uh, if I understood correctly, the question, uh, the relation, so the linkage between research centers and young entrepreneurs, giving yeah, the example it's, of it's in the direction of uh, in a small ecosystem or environment, it's easier yes. to have this, you know, constant interaction and the relationships are easier. But I think about um, other contexts or other countries in which it's not that easy to have this close relationship. And I don't know if, if uh, which are the initiatives or the type of interactions that are done, how difficult it is. Yeah. In my opinion, uh, I, can I can only say that uh, what you just referred is often mentioned that there's need to have, we need bigger interaction between the different, these different actors all involved, research centers, government, uh, Governmental and non-governmental organizations, young young entrepreneurs, because bringing everything together, everything will happen uh, differently. But for some reason, uh, unless it's for example a small ecosystem, as you just refer, uh, there's something still blocking things, isn't it? I think the approach is still very pretty much compartmentalized uh, in many ways. But if you allow me, I would return uh, a, qu a question to you: is uh, in your opinion? Do you see an advantage in having, for example, startups uh, having a close connection with research centers? Well, it's, it's working. Um, um, I'm not an expert on research. I have a, a business background, and um, you may. The thing is that you can have a very nice concept. But if you don't have this business side, you don't know how to explore it. You become a Sheldon Cooper, okay? So um, I, I think it's very important. And also, many of my friends are researchers, and I, I see them as very in intelligent people, but sometimes they miss the way to build a product. Uh, technically speaking, they're brilliant, and I, they talk about it, and I don't understand a word. <laughs> But in some other aspects, we do have this gap. It's my, yeah. I think it's super important. It's, there's a name for that, which is expertise. And sometimes uh, the difference between success and failure is know where to get the right information, uh, where it does exist, the real knowledge. So uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in that sense, I think there's still, um, it hasn't been fully acknowledged, that would be my reply, the need to, to uh, also broad, um, uh, bring the, uh, 
reduce that that gap that's uh, that still uh, exists. Uh, yeah, maybe if I can add just one thing. Uh, I think it's all about the the, the la language that you you speak. You know, I, I'm working for the the and by language, and I'm not talking about the, the real language, but you know, scientists or business people, they speak different languages. And uh, I'm working for the government, and you know, when we have to put some regulation in place, it's all the time the, the, the same way. We have a law, a proposition of law, and then all people from the industry coming are, oh, look at this, it's impossible for us, look at this, look at this, and then we, we try to, to, to manage things and understand really the, 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 the needs of those people and we have to change like almost everything. Uh, and so, yeah, the communication is, is uh, really important and we, we really need to, to build strong links uh, between both sides, people, uh, people active in the, in the industry and in research and so on, and other people, uh, for in my example, doing regulation uh, and things like that. Are there other questions from the audience? I don't see any hands, so I think we can close this panel here. Yep. I just sure. can redirect, because your question actually is uh, one that you're not alone with. Uh, what we actually see currently, that there is a, a major drive from researchers, from people that have the expertise, to bring that to the market, but they don't know how, they don't want to run the risk. Uh, and we see young entrepreneurs who actually do want to take the risk that have to drive, but actually don't have the specific ID. So what we're currently doing is with uh, the e project that we're doing for the EU, we're actually trying together to build a platform in which we can match young entrepreneurs who have an ID, who've got the network, who've got the drive, to match them to academics or to researchers to bring out their knowledge and to see how you actually can make a business out of that. So to answer your question, yeah, we're working on it. It should be live in, I think, about two, three months. Um, and the advice that I can give you, just follow the E-plus web website in which you will find more and more information about this coming up. Um, and just as a head, uh, head start, so by the EU we've been asked as a very small group to take the note on that one and we have to have at least 100 matches within now and one and a half years. So if you're now sitting here and thinking, well actually, I do want to start a firm, uh, but I still need something very good to start with, look up the website and you'll, fi you'll find some ideas of people to connect to, to actually get this thing started. Thank you, Chris. Uh, before concluding this panel, we have one last video titled Why Dream? But before watching that, I would like to give you a round of applause to our uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you.